For our final segment, we'll get an update on a months-long trial that has captivated those in the world of high-tech and biotechnology. Elizabeth Holmes was once seen as a rising star in the industry. Sporting Steve Jobs-style black turtlenecks, Holmes promoted a revolutionary portable blood testing device that promised to forever change the medical testing industry. But federal prosecutors say her company, Theranos, was built on a house of lies. She's been fighting multiple charges of securities fraud in a trial that started in early September. Sidebar co-host Nina Pulano caught up with Courthouse News reporter Matt Renda, who's been covering the trial in Northern California. Here's her report and their conversation. One of the incredible things about this country is that we can and do solve policy challenges through creativity and innovation. And I've always believed that when people find what they're truly passionate about and they make a decision to do that and stick with that no matter what, they can build great things. The scandal that swept across Silicon Valley is playing out in a federal courtroom in San Jose where Elizabeth Holmes, the creator of the company Theranos, is on trial for fraud. (laughs) Courthouse News reporter Matt Renda has been on the ground covering testimony. Hi, Matt. It's nice to have you here. Hi, Nina. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. For sure. So many of us have heard of Theranos, but for those who haven't, give us a background. This is a company that was at one time valued at $9 billion dollars. What is Theranos? What was Theranos? Um, According to its leaders, what was it creating? So Theranos was founded in 2003. Um, It was founded by, of course, Elizabeth Holmes, who is now famous or infamous, uh, depending on who you ask. Although I think mostly infamous at this point. She was 19 years old at the time. Uh, She dropped out of Stanford. By all accounts, she's actually quite a talented organic chemist. And she says um, that she founded this company in an effort to, in the sort of the classic Silicon Valley language, disrupt blood analyzing equipment. And so she basically set out to create a portable blood analyzer, which is just a device that is capable of running hundreds of blood tests, um, sometimes with blood just from the pr- prick of a finger on an actual portable device. So the theory was, as that, ah, you know, let's just say you have some medical condition um, and you are, you know, curious about, I don't know, maybe whether your cancer is going, coming back. And so you could test your own blood on a blood analyzer to see if certain levels of certain, um, you know, organic components are present in your blood at any time. Um, so obviously that had, you know, huge potential, I think, for healthcare. And then also, you know, she wanted to um, sort of, I think, you know, put out to pasture some of the old companies like Quest Diagnostics, like LabCorp, who, um, you know, were doing blood tests on these large machines inside a lab. Um, They took a long time. Uh, They were expensive. Um, It was difficult to access. Uh, So she believed that Theranos would increase uh, healthcare accessibility and that it would increase the speed at which um, you get uh, information that's vital to your health. So it began for Elizabeth Holmes and her investors. You mentioned her investors, and of course she had some really high-profile folks that were backing her, including two former U.S. defense secretaries, former secretaries of state, um, billionaire investors like Rupert Murdoch and the Walton family, who of course own Walmart, um, also the DeVos family, as in former U.S. Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, some individual families put down $100 million. What went wrong? The short answer is that her devices did not work. I think what's at issue in the trial is whether she knew that they did not work and she was bilking uh, these investors in order to personally profit, live the high life there for a little while, or if she always believed that she was just on the cusp of a breakthrough in making these work. They were these little devices and they actually did conduct some blood tests uh, accurately. But I think the problem for Elizabeth and for Theranos is that they were telling these investors, and you rightly said, people like George Schultz were talking about uh, 
people like uh, Defense Secretary Mattis, Rupert Murdoch, the DeVos family, all of those people uh, that you mentioned, she was telling them that these uh, portable blood analyzers were capable of, in the neighborhood of about 200 blood tests accurately, uh, when in reality they could do about 12. What exactly are the charges now against Elizabeth Holmes? She faces about 12 federal charges. She's really centrally accused of defrauding two different classes of people. On the one hand, she's accused of defrauding the actual patients um, that used um, the blood test analyzers in around 2013 and 2014. I think the classic story that came out of trial, and I think it's actually pretty damning for Ms. Holmes, is that uh, there was a pregnant lady who took um, a pregnancy test using uh, the Edison device and basically found out the test told her that she wasn't pregnant. So she then began a medi medication regime um, in line with somebody who's not pregnant, but as a regime that you would not recommend to somebody who was pregnant. And then later she came to find out that her test was false. You know, she, she relied on this test and, you know, and took medications that were dangerous to her, to her baby and to her family. And then the other class of people that she is charged with defrauding is investors uh, like, you know, Rupert Murdoch, the DeVos family, also Safeway and Walgreens. So if the jury finds her guilty, Holmes is looking at possible prison time. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think that she's looking at, uh, you know, substantial prison time. It's This stuff always gets, you know, reduced on good behavior. She stands to do uh, multiple decades um, in federal prison. I don't think that she, she'll do that, even if she's convicted. Um, but yeah, big time fines and, and definitely, uh, I would say, a considerable prison sentence of, you know, probably in real life, like, a, you know, a couple of years, maybe even as many as five years, if convicted. Can you just talk a little bit about kind of the scene at trial? Elizabeth Holmes is there. She has family supporting her. Have you been able to gauge reactions from Elizabeth Holmes, from the jury? The trial on the first day was a circus, right? So there are people who have been there since like two, three in the morning. There's these, I think, the three or four uh, women from some Scandinavian country. I forget if it's Sweden or Norway, but they dress like Miss Holmes and cheer her on. Um, Elizabeth Holmes is present every day in court. And there are like a couple of interested citizens who like to come. It's fun to talk to them because they like to speculate uh, about what's going on. Hey, listen, a couple of them could probably do my job because they have some, you know, pretty, uh, pretty solid insights. And Ms. Holmes is very composed in court. She stands very straight. It's almost like uh, she went um, to class about etiquette. Um, she very, very rarely changes her posture. Um, she very rarely uh, reacts. Um, and there's been some really embarrassing things that have been shared. Her business partner, Ramesh Balwani, Sunny Balwani is how he's referred to in court. Um, so they were business partners, but they were also romantic partners. And so some of the text messages that get shared in court are quite uh, intimate. I do have to say that it's impressive that when those are shared, she has a certain poise about her. Their relationship is very strange, right? Okay, so they meet in between her high school year and her entry to Stanford. So we're talking about 18-year-old kid. And she meets Bolwani at some kind of conference in China. Um, he's 37 years old at the time, right? So he's 20 years uh, her senior. A, uh, a, a very wealthy and successful tech executive. So he comes to work for Theranos to kind of handle more of the business side because she's an organic chemist, remember? And a young woman in like her mid-20s. What the text messages demonstrate is that I think she was genuinely infatuated with Balwani and it doesn't always seem like he reciprocates, which is was illuminating for me and I think might be illuminating in terms of the actual trial. And it's kind of the central question uh, that's going to go towards, you know, resolving if there was fraud at Theranos, who was really responsible for it? it? Sounds like they had a pretty complicated relationship to check. Bolwani is indicted as well, right? I mean, he's... Yeah, so Bolwani, so exactly. So they both got rung up together, right? And they both were sort of co-defendants when the SEC fined them and removed their ability to run companies and all of those kinds of things. But somewhere along the line, and I think it was probably about a year and a half ago, um, sometime in maybe late 2019, maybe early 2020, um, they decided to part. They wanted to be tried separately. And it was... Elizabeth Holmes, who wanted to be tried separately um, from Balwani. And I think you see why. I think because their strategy is basically to foist a lot of the blame uh, upon him. You 
you mentioned some of the people testifying already, but have there been any moments that really stood out to you, either evidence that the prosecutors have presented or or people testifying where you felt like, ooh, this is a this is a big moment or, you know, that's something in the in the trial that we're going to hear about in closing arguments or, you know, any of those moments? I think the short answer uh, and this, you know, really, I think um, kind of reflects where the government is at in this case. But the short answer is no, unfortunately, that there is nothing that really sticks out that actually they don't really have a smoking gun against Ms. Holmes. You know, the court of the public opinion is different, right, from a, a courtroom. And, you know, I'll just give you a for instance, right? We were talked about the DeVos family. They actually have an investment chief that makes sort of decisions on behalf of the family, not on behalf of Amway, but on behalf of the family about where to invest. And they decided that they wanted to invest in Theranos, and they invested $100 million. And Lisa Peterson talked about her decision to invest $100 million. And she said, and again, this is a government witness, she said that, uh, one of the reasons they decided to invest such a large amount is because there was a document um, that had Pfizer's logo on it that talked about the accuracy of the assays or the blood test. Assay is a word for blood test. And really kind of just fully endorsed um, what the direction that Theranos was going, right? And I think... Um, you know, it's later revealed that Theranos produced this document, as, you know, basically put a Pfizer logo on a Theranos produced document, which is obviously quite unethical. And I would even argue fraudulent. But what the government has to prove here, and this is like really important, the government has to approve that like Elizabeth Holmes directed the scheme herself. So we've kind of woven in the defense uh, approach throughout the interview, but so far, I guess, watching cross-examination and watching kind of the strategy that the defense team is using, do they have any moments they were able to make Elizabeth Holmes look really good or that you think the jury might empathize with her or sympathize with her a little bit? Basically, their strategy is to say that Elizabeth Holmes was a 19-year-old person who believed in this company and she tried with all of her might, including working long hours you know, o over the weekends to basically build this company into what her vision called for. And she just failed, that she just fell short. She made some bad decisions, but she was also really young and she listened to some bad advice from Sonny Balwani. And so it all ended up in failure, but failure, business failure isn't illegal in the United States of America. And frankly, it's, you know, altogether common. And so I think that that argument really did resonate with the jury. I think one of the worst facts of all for the government just overarching, as Elizabeth Holmes never sold a single share of stock in Theranos the whole time that she ran that company. And it just doesn't make sense if you're a person who's out to just defraud people of money that you goose your company value up to where, as you said in the intro, it's worth $9 billion. You are holding, you know, probably billions worth of dollars of shares, and yet you don't sell a single stock. Uh, it seems like this is a person that believes in their company and believes that maybe that stock is going to be worth even more one day. So it's not all about just like selling shares, but I think it's a tough fact for the government. It's one that they're going to have to overcome. I think that they're going to have to explicitly explain it to the jury, and they have not done so yet. So trial's already been going on for a few months, Then we have a ways left to go, but eventually we'll get a verdict. And I want to ask what the outcome of this trial means for Silicon Valley. Why is it such a huge deal for the biotech industry? And if you have any predictions. I think it's a huge deal for Silicon Valley. I really do. And a lot of people in Silicon Valley, when they look at the, the kind of what Elizabeth Holmes did, I think it's par for the course. I think that there's a lot of startup people, right, who go to investors and, you know, they put lipstick on the pig. They, they got a business and, you know, they got an idea and they want to present it in the best possible light to investors. I mean, that's the name of the game here a little bit. If Elizabeth Holmes does get rung up on fraud charges for doing something that, you know, in varying degrees, shall we say, is pretty common in the industry right now, um, then I don't know, maybe it has a chilling effect on the degree to which certain people you know, are willing to kind of burnish reality a little bit. You know, and then there's other people that are going to say, though, that, 
that this was clear fraud and this goes beyond the pale of just, you know, trying to uh, give a good face to your business that this, that this, that this crossed the line uh, that most people, um, you know, don't cross in Silicon Valley. I think that those questions are major questions uh, for the industry. And uh, I think that this verdict is going to be uh, impactful. Uh, in terms of predictions, I, you know, listen, you, you can never predict a jury trial, right? Because like juries are weird and, you know, it just depends on what they think and who the leader of the jury is and how persuasive that leader, you know, he or she is. That said, I will make a prediction. <laughs> um, and I just, I think that she'll, I think she'll beat the case. I don't feel like the government is making this airtight, persuasive case that then Elizabeth Holmes has to work hard to undo. I feel like they are making a so-so case and that they have a lot of circumstantial evidence, um, but nothing like super strong. And, you know, the defense hasn't even gone yet. Exciting stuff from a huge, huge case. Thanks so much for joining us. And I look forward to continuing to read your reporting. Thanks, Nina. Hey, it was fun talking. And uh, yeah, we should do this again. Absolutely. Managing wildlife, managing sewage, managing expectations. You just heard three stories that will have a major impact on American lives, from Rocky Mountain ranchers to Southern California beachgoers to high-dollar venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to Sidebar CNS on Apple Podcasts or Spotify so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on Twitter, we're at Sidebar CNS and at Courthouse News. In our next episode, we'll delve into the mysteries of UFO sightings, extraterrestrial life, and hear about some of the wackiest cases our reporters have encountered. See you next time.